morning. Good morning. It's another good day that the Lord has given us together with his people to hear about him, to talk to him, to encourage one another with his attributes and his doings. And as the ushers are giving out these worship sheets to the kids that are among us, I want to make two quick announcements. First is as regards the members meeting. A reminder, we usually have the members meeting every last Sunday of the month. And even though that Sunday will be the Easter Sunday, would still want to have the meeting that day. So kindly members, stick around. That Sunday we'll have the meeting. The next thing is we are appealing for help uh, in our ministries. Some of our ministries ushering. We need saints to help with that. Audiovisual, the guys who deal with the video and the mixer and everything, setting up and everything. We need help in that regard, and also with the kids. That's the Sunday school at 9 a.m., and also the junior church that is happening currently. So if you'd be interested in any of this, kindly see any of the deacons or the pastors. They'll be able to direct you adequately. As regards the worship sheets, for the kids, I'll, we, we, are, we are trying to insist them because they are really helpful in helping the kids to follow through the sermon. There are places to fill in, and if, if you have any difficulty in filling it in, you can talk to me after the service, and we'll see how best to help you through. If you still have any questions about the sermon, even after filling it, feel free to talk to your parents or come to me or any of the pastors. We'll, we'll see how best to support you. So that's, that's it. Uh, now to the main thing that brings us here on this Lord's Day is we want to follow through what we did last week. And last week we looked at false teachers. We looked at godliness and contentment. We looked at... Uh, contentment and riches. We looked at discontentment and the pursuit for riches and the things of this world that can jeopardize even your own soul. And we, as we were ending, we said that the antidote, the medicine, or the remedy for this worldliness or desire for riches is not more stuff or even it's not been taken out of the circumstance that you are in, even though we are called to pray for change in circumstances. But that's not the true remedy. So we say the remedy is seeing, is looking, loving, and savoring Jesus Christ. So we, our hearts need to be tuned in such a way that the affections, the desires are towards Christ. And the, the, in, in simple terms, the remedy for idolatry is not now not loving, but instead loving the true one, loving the Lord Jesus Christ. And perhaps this looks quite simplistic. I mean, you are telling us that the remedy of me wanting to gain the whole world is simply loving the Lord. It looks simple and sometimes looks off uh, as though something for this immaterial desire that we have is just this simple thing and something that is almost removed from reality. Love the Lord your God. We may even be judged to mean that we are saying that this world doesn't matter or it's not even real. We should pursue that which is eternal and forget everything that we want. We, we, let's, let's forget everything that we have in this world and pursue only Christ, pursue only heaven. That's half-truth. 
because he has not taken, a, taken us out of this world. He has kept us in this world, but we are not of this world. And we understand that such, such a view, that's how these death cults begin, where they want to be removed from any pain from the world, from any pleasures, from in, any appeasements. That's how these cults begin. And we think that's something that the ascetics, the Eastern religions do. That's something that is not near us. 24 years ago, there was a death cult in Uganda, and it killed 778 people. But it's in Uganda. Uh, down at the coast, there is the Shakahola, removed from this world. So we want to see Christ and to savor him and to love him, who prayed that we don't be taken out of this world. Yes, we desire heaven. Yes, we desire Christ. But we are not taken out of this world, but rather kept from the evil one, even as we are not of this world. So yes, we'll have and we'll be kept in this world with its sins, its pleasures, and sometimes even the riches may come your way. But the goal is to see him and to love him. And so we don't have to extinguish ourselves. We don't have to take ourselves out of this world to possess eternal life. Instead, we have eternal life. We have possessed eternal life. And our direction is heavenward. We want to come to a place where we desire Jesus. We want to come to a place where we know what Jesus we are desiring. So the, the goal really is to see what, what is this direction that we are aiming at. We want to say that direction is godly. That direction is is, is all about God. That direction is towards heaven. We want to see, okay, what else? What else are we told? We'll see a charge that is given to us. And that charge is from heaven, the host of heaven. We want to see what, what, what now, what's the end? We want to see our treasure is in heaven kept for us. So I'll ask you kindly to stand for the reading of God's word, God's word and we'll read First Timothy. If you are able to, kindly stand for the reading of God's word. First Timothy chapter 6. I'll read the entire chapter, but we'll be focusing from verse 11 to 16. So kindly take note. This is God's word. Let all who are under a yoke as born servants regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. Those who have believing masters must not be disrespectful on the ground that they are brothers, on the ground that they are brothers. Rather, they must serve all the better sins those who benefit by their good service are believers and beloved. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind, deprived in truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we, if we have food and clothing, with this we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pounds. Verse 11. 
But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, 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 love, steadfastness, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you are called and about which you, are, you have made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Jesus Christ who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in an approachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, not to set their hopes, on the certainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good. They are to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. For by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. Grace be to you. This is the word of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful. Thankful that you have given us the scriptures, your word, the bread of life that we can devour and take in and we find life and satisfaction in your word. We find delight and joy in your word. Even as you've placed us in this world, you have not left us in this world. You have given us a guide, a lamp as unto our feet. So help us, O oh Lord, that we'll have a right view of godliness, a right view of heaven, a right view of Christ who came and gave himself for us. So be with us, O Lord, and it's in him, our Savior, we pray. Amen. You may sit. The, the sermon today as was sent in the letter and also in the bulletin. I've titled it heavenward, heavenly, and in heaven. And we'll see where we get this. I decided to have a heavenward approach in the sermon because of how we may not understand what we are saying in saying that riches are not the ultimate pursuit in this life. Yes, we've told you you cannot build your own heaven here, but we want to tell you Heaven is what should be your pursuit. Heaven is where we find our Lord giving us charge, a charge. And in heaven, that's where our treasure is. So the first thing we'll look at is the, the character of the godly, the godly heavenward man. That's verse 11 and 12. Then we'll see of the charge. Before God, there is the heavenly charge, verse, verse 13 to 15. The first part of verse 15. Then we'll see of our treasure in heaven, who is God in heaven. Verse 15, the second part to 16. And so Paul begins by saying, but as for you, O man of God, flee these things, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness, fight the good fight of faith, take hold of the eternal life of which you are called, about which you are made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. 
but as for you. Of course, he's talking about what he has mentioned before. He's spoken on false teachers, on discontentment, on the godlessness of these false teachers, the pursuit of riches, and the losing of your soul. So he says, Timothy, let that not be you. And for you, Christian, let, not, let that not be you. So Paul was addressing the false teachers and their doctrine. And then he veered off to address even a specific of their teaching, which is godliness as a means of gain and the discontentment thereof. And now he wants to address the faithful teachers, the men of God. And like this Timothy, who is his, his son in the faith, and verse 11 tells me, you man of God, you godly man, you who have been bought by God, flee these things. Timothy, run from these things. Flee from these things. There is no negotiation. Run from these things. But don't just run from, but run to. So you are running from these things. Where are you running to? Flee to righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. So yes, we'll know the false teachers. We'll know the false teachers by their bad fruits of the flesh. Galatians 5, 19, 21. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies. How many of these were mentioned of the false teachers? Almost all. Yes, because they produce the very fruit of the flesh. Why? Because they are of the flesh, they are of the world, and they are of the devil. No wonder, the, no wonder the gloom of utter darkness is prepared and reserved from them, for them. Jude 1.13. But also, we have the faithful teachers, the men of God. We shall know them still by their fruits. And what's their fruits? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Why? Because they are born from above. They are born of God, the faithful men of God. So for Timothy and any other faithful men, for Timothy and anyone whose pursuit is heavenward, this is their charge. Pursue these things. He's not been made a man of God because they declare themselves to be men of God. No, they are men of God because first, they have been convicted of their own sin. They have repented of their own sin. They have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then they have set their pursuit towards heaven, towards God. So instead of depravities, pride, conceit, pursue righteousness. This righteousness is the inner life shape, life shaped after the law of God. That's righteousness. Pursue that. So instead of material godlessness, pursue godliness, which is the sincere fervent piety implying devotedness to God in heart, life, and conformity to his image. Pursue that. Pursue godliness. Instead of ignorance, knowing nothing, and being deprived in the knowledge of Christ, pursue faith. Pursue knowledge in Christ the assurance of the promises of God. Know the promises of God. Be convinced of the unseen. Instead of envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicion, frictions, pursue love. And this is the mainspring of Christian life. Instead of snares, harm, and plunging yourself into ruin, stabbing yourself with many pangs, and wandering away from the faith, Pursue steadfastness. Be immovable. Be firm. Be steadfast. Persevere to the end. Instead of quarrels, craving for controversies, frictions, even, even though you know more, even though you are blessed with the knowledge, pursue gentleness, which is restrained might. Yes, you know, 
but restrain yourself with all humility and grace. So pursue these things, Timothy. Pursue them. Pursue them as a Christian. But how do you pursue these things? Verse 12. We fight the good fight of faith. We, we don't just sit. We don't just coast. We don't just sit comfortable and expect that these things will come. We fight. We wage war. We fight and fight good. This, this is not a suggestion. This is not a suggestion that you ought to fight. This is a command. And fighting you must fight and fight good. But again, you'll ask, who are we fighting? Am I fighting the church member? Am I fighting even the false teachers? Am I fighting my pastor or my deacon? Am I fighting my spouse? No, 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 no. We, 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 we don't fight these people. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, Ephesians 6.12 but against rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We fight against those. We wage war against those. Rulers, authority, cosmic powers, spiritual forces. It looks like a movie. And we have a very Hollywood way of thinking about these principalities. We, th we think of them as things we ought to fear. Maybe, maybe that's Nollywood. Things we ought to fear. No, we, 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 are, we, are, we have no fear about these things. We fight confidently. Why? Because victory is assured. So picture, picture this as a fight. Christian on one end and the enemy on the other end. And before the fight, the ref says, Christian has won. No fight yet. Then he flags off the fight. So it's, it's not really a normal fight. Why? It's not a normal fight. Because the one we fight for, the one who gives us life to fight, the coach of this fight has already fought before us. He has fought before us and has won. And so even as we fight, we are fighting a defeated foe. We are fighting a fight that we are assured of winning. I mean, read Revelation 17, 14. The Lamb has won. He has won. So we fight confidently. We fight hopefully. We fight good. He reigned over sin and death. He is building his church. He is interceding for us. He has won. And so we are convinced. We are fully convinced of winning the fight. The chosen, we, the chosen and faithful, are now fighting a defeated foe. And we are fighting clothed in this heavenly armor. We are not fighting like David, clothed in an armor of this world. So we take up the whole armor of God. We take it up and wear it. We take the belt of truth, which is the scriptures that holds everything together. We take the whole counsel of God. We read it, we memorize, we meditate, we believe and live. We take the breastplate of righteousness. The faith that is, the righteousness that is from another person. We wear it. And we are convinced, we are assured of this salvation. We take on the shoes of the gospel of peace. We preach it. We believe it. We share it. We commend it to people. We take the shield of faith. And this shield, the thing with the shield is that it worked best in the company of others. So everyone has the shield of faith and they form a shield wall and any dart, any enemy 
any darts from the evil one will not penetrate into the church. 2 Timothy 2.22, pursue these things with those who call on the Lord with a pure heart. With those who call on the Lord with a pure heart. Pursue these things, the shield of faith. So we pursue it with those of common faith, with your fellow church member, in fellowship, in the church community. And finally, we put on the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. Knowing and meditating of the salvation that has come, Ephesians 2, 5. Knowing of the salvation that we are being saved, 1 Corinthians 15, 2. And the salvation that will come, Romans 5, 9. And onward to heaven. We protect these heavenly minds with the helmet of salvation. And it's in this, in verse 12, he says, take hold. Take hold. Taking hold is not holding and releasing. Taking hold is holding firm and never letting go. Take hold of the eternal life. Desire and pursue these things that truly matter. That's how you take hold. You take hold by holding fast to that which truly matters, that which is eternal, that which is eternal life and your eternal God. So we wage war by meditating of the eternal life that we have, that we've been given. And as we've said, this eternal life begins now, begins when you profess, begins when you're born from above. Why? Because this is eternal life. Knowing the Father, knowing God the Father, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom he sends. John 17, 3. That's eternal life. So once you know the Father, the only true God, once you know Jesus Christ, once you have believed, repented and believed, eternal life begins. We don't have to extinguish ourselves to possess eternal life. Eternal life begins now. And that is what truly matters. Why? Because what is seen is transient. Second Corinthians 4.18. What is seen is transient and is temporal. It's passing away. But unseen promised things are eternal. Take hold of eternal life. Take hold of that which is eternal. We hold tight by looking forward, by looking to Christ. We, we dig into the scriptures, we dive into the scriptures, we mine the scriptures looking for the promises of that which is eternal. That's, that's a tactic of fighting. So we believe, we trust, we know that he is faithful to accomplish that which he has promised. Just like creation when he spoke and it was, he said, let there be light and there was light. Let there be the sun, the moon, the stars and there was. And now he says, let there be eternal life to all that repent and believe and there will be eternal life. As sure as we see the stars, the moons, and everything created, as sure as we can see everything that he spoke and came to existence, as sure as we are convinced that what he has spoken in his word will come to fruition. That's faith. We are assured that what he has spoken, it will come to be. So hold, hold tight, hold tight to these promises. Dig them, believe them, know them, memorize them. Talk about these promises. Remind each other of these promises. I 
And even more, these promises find their yes and amen in Christ Jesus. So hold, as you hold as well, look back to when you are saved, to when you believed in Christ. Like the Jews always being reminded of their exodus when God saved them from Egypt, how he delivered them. He reminds them countless times, I saved you from Egypt. So as well, remember how the Lord saved you from your deadness and sin. Remember the life you are called in regret. Remember the life you are called out in regret. And the life you are called into in joy and gladness. Verse 12, you are called into eternal life and have made the good confession before many witnesses. This good confession bears witness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 10, 9 to 10. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For the heart one believes and one is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. The good confession. Yes, you, you have said, the Lord has saved me. The Lord has received me. And maybe, maybe I'll need to pause and ask, how many would say this here? How many would say with a good, clear conscience that the Lord has saved me? He has received me, a vile sinner. How many? How many would say that? How many would say, I went to Christ and he received me? How many would say, I have confessed and he has forgiven me? Or even better, I have believed and he has saved me. He has justified me. He counts me as not a sinner anymore. How many would say that? And even, and even better, I want to be more specific. Have you gone to Christ? You who thinks that this is not for you. You who thinks that, no, this, I'm, I'm too much of a sinner. There is no way that Christ can receive me. Have you made the good confession? Yes, I'm, I'm talking to you. Have you made the good confession? You who thinks you cannot, you can out the grace of God. Or you child who thinks you're too young to make the good confession. He says he will by no means cast those who come to him. He will by no means cast those who come to him. No one can, tru can truly say he went to Christ and he rejected me. No, no one can say I made the good confession of Christ and he rejected me. Nobody. So the call is come to Christ. Come to Christ. He is willing. He receives sinners. This man receives sinners. So make, make the good confession. Say, Christ has saved this wretch. I was blind, but now I'm found. I was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I can see. And tell us, after making this confession, come tell us. You want to make it even before many witnesses. Like the Ethiopian eunuch, you can come and tell us, what prevents me to be baptized? We can gather the water, we can make all the arrangements and baptize you, and you can make the good confession even before many witnesses. You will declare before many witnesses that you've been buried with Christ. You've risen to the newness of life. This is what Timothy and all of us are exhorted that either have done or will do or have to do it. Make the good confession. 
So we wage war even looking back at what we've been saved from. So you remember you've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer you who lives, but Christ who lives in you. And the life you now live, you who have made a good confession, and the life you now live in the flesh, you live by faith. In this world, you live by faith. In the Son of God who loved you, who loved you and gave himself for you, Galatians 2.20. This is the good confession. Have you made it? And even more, by baptism, we declare it before many witnesses. So consider a man, a man who flees, a man who fights, a man who pursues the very nature and character of God. He holds tight to the eternal life. He holds tight to the eternal life that he is called into and has made the good confession before many witnesses. This is a godly man. He has his direction heavenward, but even more, he has a charge before him. Second thing, before God, the heavenly charge, verse 13 to 15. I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Jesus Christ, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display in the proper time. So this, this charge that now Paul gives Timothy and all of us is not an isolated charge, different from the first point. This charge is also part of the, of the fleeing, of the flight, is, is a charge also of the pursuit, is a charge also of the fight that we are engaging. And Paul takes it to the highest, have, highest office of the land, highest office that there is, highest office that there ever will be. He takes it there and says, even, even this charge is not just my charge, really, it's before God the Father and God the Son. And the authority that Paul has in giving this charge is secondary, primary to God. This charge is before two persons, verse 13. One, the one who gives life to all things, and second, the one who made a good confession before Pontius Pilate. So we don't have to think more because we know it's God the Father who gives life to all things, and second, it's God the Son, the incarnate God, who made a good confession before Pontius Pilate. But I will add, we are not neglecting the third person of the Trinity because he is the one who gives us the power and empowers us and trains us to keep the charge. So first, the first person of the Trinity, God the Father, this charge is before God the Father. He is the eternal God, the one who gives life to all things the one who breathed into the nostrils of the first man, Genesis 2.7. He is God who made the world and everything in it. Being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. Acts 17.24-25. He is the creator God. He is the sovereign God. He is in heaven. He does all that he pleases. He is not in need, as though, uh, as though we, we would give him anything he doesn't have. He is the life giver. He is the sustainer. He speaks and animates all dead things. And he still speaks today, even to dead things, dead sinners, giving them life eternal life. Secondly, this charge is before the Lord Jesus Christ. 
the eternal God. He is God. He is the one through whom all things were made. He took on flesh and descended into the world and dwelled among us. He lived a perfect, sinless life, but he was treated as though he was a sinner. He was presented before human authorities, flogged to a Gentile Roman pilot. And this pilot had nothing to do with him. And these are the sins that we read from John 18. Pilate asks Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus says, do you say this in your own accord or did others say, say it to you about me? Pilate says, am I a Jew? Your own nation and chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I may not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not from the world. Pilate said to him, so are you king? Jesus answered, you say that I am king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? Jesus gave the good confession. And he was killed as though a sinner. Earlier, the, the Jews labeled him as such. If this man were not doing evil, they are talking about the sovereign God doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you, John 18, 30. And Pilate, not being of the truth, neither understanding truth, frees a guilty man, Barabbas, and puts a righteous man to death. That is why the Lord came. We ought to relate with Pilate in sin and in the lies that we have believed. We ought to know that we are not of truth. We have not believed truth. We do not listen to his own voice. See your sin and see your lies, crucifying Christ. But even, don't, don't stay there. Relate even with Barabbas, Christ taking your place. The death that Barabbas was to die, Christ dies. And even better, the death that you are supposed to die, Christ dies. His confession was good because all our hopes, salvation, are built upon the truth of it. If you have kept this charge, this command, this gospel resort, this calling, and the newness of life, if you have confessed that Christ came, that Christ and his charge gave you life, that Christ's life, death, and resurrection gave you life, then it's only prudent that now you keep your life free from stain and reproach. That's verse 14. Keep your life free from reproach. Don't preach the gospel and live in sin. Don't preach life and live as one who is dead in sin. Don't preach God and live like a heathen. Remember, it is God who gives life, especially this new life. Don't stain it with the death of sinfulness. Don't reproach it with the bad character of the false teachers. Remember, Jesus made a good confession. So not only are we to imitate him in making our good confession, but we understand that his confession paves way for our very salvation. So keep, keep on this, Timothy. Keep on this, dear Christian, till he appears. Verse 14. Till the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. When will his appearing be? We, we don't know. It will be abrupt. 
he'll come like a thief. And that should awaken us to live our lives free from reproach, free from sin, free from any stain. And when he comes, all faith will be complete. All that we've been assured all along will be fulfilled. All that we've hoped for will come to fruition, will be now present. All unseen will be seen and tangible. The final enemy, death, will be defeated. And our bodies will be transformed to be like his. The gospel that was ridiculed, vilified, scorned, is now vindicated. The judgment will be pronounced on the wicked and the righteous to eternal bliss with him in the proper time. In his proper time. We bear patiently, we wait patiently. Hope demands patience. Romans 8.25 if we hope for what we don't see, we wait for it with patience. So until then, the charge is to wait, keep our testimony, keep our confession, keep the gospel that we profess free from any stain or reproach. So we flee, pursue, fight. We hold on to the gospel and eternal life, holding tight and free from stain and sin till he comes back. Who, who is coming back? Our treasure, the third thing. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in an approachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion forever. Paul now breaks into a doxology, into a praise, probably taken from a hymn that they sang in the Ephesians church. And our commentator says this about the, the two verses that we've read. This is the loftiest, the most sublimin, the sublimest epithets, epithets that, in, that the inspired pen of Paul could frame to dignify his description. And we could read just that. We could read these two verses and say amen. But, but we won't. We want to see. We want to savor. We want to treasure. We want to know this God that we love. He is blessed and only sovereign. Blessed and only sovereign. He's blessed. He's happy. All happiness is in him. He is mighty, omniscient omnipotent, omnipresent, all of them submit. He submits all creation, wisdom, knowledge, power, forces, time, space, matter to him. He is sovereign. He is the king of kings and lord of lords. He claims dominion over everything. Pilots, presidents, kings, lords, or the earth lords and kingdoms are his. Even them are demanded to make the good confession. And they will. And they will. That's why we read Psalm 2. They will. He alone has immortality. Angels and our souls are immortal. But they are not immortal in themselves. We draw immortality from him. He is from eternity. He is eternal. He is to eternity. He is immortal. He dwells in an approachable light. He is the unseen one. He wraps himself with light as with a garment. Psalm 104, 2. He dwells in radiating, blinding, and killing glory. Remember Moses. He had to be hidden in a cleft lest he die. He dwells in an approachable light. Even angels who are sinless cover their faces with wings. They can't behold him. Isaiah 6. He's the one worthy of all honor and eternal dominion. He is worthy for who he is. He demands our worship, our reverence, and claims ownership over everything. Everything that has ever existed, everything that exists now, everything that will ever exist, 
God says, mine. That's mine. It's enough if we end there. It has nothing to do with us. These attributes have nothing to do with us. He is worthy. He is self-sufficient. But, but again, he brings all these attributes to converge at the cross, to meet at the cross. And they meet harmoniously at the cross. The cross that was meant for you. The cross that was meant for me. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Psalm 85.10 Truth, justice, and wrath for the ruined yet loved sinner is fulfilled in the merciful, righteous one nailed on that cross. And so there is peace between man and God. So then we rejoice because even these attributes are for us. They are for us. He's all together ours, and we are all together his. His attributes are for us who are in Christ. So he is the blessed and only sovereign. We draw all our joy in him. We draw all our felicity from the well of this joy. He is sovereign, so the peace and comfort that we enjoy, that we should enjoy, that we should pursue, is in him. He holds everything. His sovereignty is for our peace. There are no surprises in him. So even for us who are in him, there are no surprises for us. It is planned. It is allowed. And the Lord knows. So why should we not be content? if the Lord is sovereign. Sorry. Why should we not be content since the Lord is sovereign? It's not if. We've seen that he is sovereign. Since he is sovereign, why should we not be content in whatever circumstance? He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He has conquered your rebellious heart. He has submitted that heart to the truth of his rule. And he has made you godly. He is the king. Even the earthly kings will submit to him. He loves and he laughs and holds them in derision. Psalm 2. He is immortal. He alone is immortal. Only an immortal God can secure our eternal life. How else will we have, will we draw eternity if the one who promises is not eternal? How, how will that be? How will it be that we possess eternity, we possess eternal life, but the one who promises eternal life is not eternal, is not immortal? It can't be. He is immortal. He dwells in an approachable light, so nothing can get to him. Why should we be afraid of darkness? Why should we be afraid of evil? We need not be afraid of evil. Our Lord dwells in an approachable light. Even evil cannot get to him. He is holy. He is worthy of all honor and dominion. So for us is to honor him, worship, revere, love, and delight in him. So in conclusion, let's, let's hold everything together from verse 3. The false teachers in verse 3 preach a different God. They don't preach the King of kings and Lord of lords. The godliness in verse 6 that we are to model after and empowered by this God, for he is the one who lives in an approachable light. He cannot be defiled. The contentment in verse 8 is fashioned and supplied by the sovereign blessed Lord. 
the true riches that we are to pursue, not the worldly riches, the true riches that we are to pursue are in the God of all dominion and honor. That's the God. So we flee, we flee, pursue, and fight, and keep the gospel and eternal life that we are called into, we are holding into, free from stain and reproach, for he is coming back. The reward, the culmination of all our pursuits, the end of all our goals, the object of all our faith, the source and the hope, the only hope that we should have is this treasure that is our God. And he is soon to appear. Be like the saints of the old. Be like the saints of the old. Asking and constantly looking forward to the day that they say, Behold, he comes with clouds descending. Behold, he comes with clouds descending and everything will be made right. The Lord's people said, Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we long for the day of the returning of Christ. We look forward to his return when all evil will be purged. Us who are alive, us who are yours, will be transformed to the likeness of your son. All our pursuits will come to end, all our wars, all our, the fights that we wage will come to an end. And we'll look forward, we'll be satisfied in your coming back. Not scared because we are yours. Not worried because we are in Christ. So we long for the day, O oh Lord. We long for when Christ comes back, takes us back. So guide us to remember these things, to know that our journey is heavenward, to know that we have a charge to keep this godliness, to keep the gospel that we profess free from stain and uh, reproach. And help us to love and savor the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to love and savor you. To love you, the Lord our God, with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind. So be with us, O oh Lord. And it's in Christ our Savior we pray.